Hi, welcome back to Discovering Patterns in the Microbiome. Today we're going to be giving a background uh, introduction to supervised learning. And the, the reason we're using it is for doing biomarker discovery. So we want to figure out sets of uh, <clears throat> species or genes that are predictive of some clinical state or some environmental state of the community. And when you, uh, when you look at a typical microbiome data set, you might have a few hundred or if you're lucky, a thousand samples. And then it's often very high dimensional. So we get thousands of OTUs, for example. And that, uh, that goes along with being sparse. So here's a little screen capture of the first fraction of a file in Excel. And I've colored the non-zero entries red. So you can see that most of the entries are zero. And this is actually very typical of a microbiome data set. So why are we using machine learning? Machine learning is designed to handle large numbers of independent variables, so it can handle that high dimensionality. Um, it can handle sparse data. And it's, uh, it's often geared toward figuring out which of those many independent variables are actually important for doing uh, prediction. The purpose of machine learning is usually to build a predictive model, uh, at least for supervised learning. And so, um, so in a clinical setting, that's often what we want to do. And um, in, in machine learning, we're also using information theory to estimate how well the model will generalize to future data. Um, for those of you who have a background in statistics, I love this glossary that uh, Robert Tipsharani put together. So you can see um, where a statistician might say model, a uh, machine learning person might say uh, network or graphs, a statistician might say parameters, whereas a machine learning expert would say weights. And then finally, um, a large grant in statistics is about 50,000, while a large grant in uh, machine learning is a million. A nice place to have a meeting, <coughs> a meeting in machine learning is Snowbird, Utah, the French Alps. A nice place to have a meeting in statistics is Las Vegas in August. Um, so that's just a little uh, glossary for those of you who have a background in statistics. And uh, the, the application of machine learning here is going to be um, in building classifiers. So, um, so an obvious application would be a patient comes in and gets their microbiota sequenced and then we use some machine learning based classifier to predict which care path they should go on. Now, um, there are other potential applications, so we can do this for early detection of disease. Um, the, uh, there has been some uh, application in forensic identification. We can do source tracking, which we'll talk about later. Um, we can also try to detect mislabeled or contaminated samples using supervised learning. So here's a picture of an easy classification task. This is a heat map of relative abundance of different species. So each column is a different species. And then the rows are samples. And you can see there are several different treatment groups that we're trying to classify. And when you look at the, um, the relative abundances, it's quite clear that, uh, that there are very different sets of species in these different groups. So this is an easy classification task. You might see other tasks that look more like this. This is a hard uh, classification task where it's not clear, at least to the human eye, that there are linear combinations of different uh, features that are more abundant in treatment one or more abundant, abundant in treatment two. So there are no obvious indicator species here. And we're going to be working on a number of um, tasks, some of which are hard, some of which are easy. So here's an example analysis uh, from the whole body data set that was published by Liz Costello uh, and Rob Knight in 2009. Um, they sampled 17 different body sites on the human body and uh, they had estimated that there were around 14,000 OTUs or species. And what we're trying to do here is classify the samples by body habitat using machine learning. So, um, so what I did for this was to break the samples up into the broad body habitats. So there's gut, oral, and skin and then, um, then ran it through a random forest classifier, which is built into Chime. And what you see is that um, there are some bugs that tend to be more abundant in the gut, 
um, other bugs that tend to be more abundant in the oral sites, and then a whole bunch of other bugs that tend to be more abundant in the skin. And in fact, um, this classifier has an expected accuracy on future data of 99.2%. So it's a highly accurate, easy classification task. Another example analysis is in forensics. So this is from uh, data sets uh, from Noah Fuhrer and Rob Knight uh, and their collaborators in 2010, examining the bugs living on people's fingertips and then on their keyboards. And uh, in the resulting data, there were 120 samples from three different people with about 550 OTUs. And the goal here was to classify by subject. So here again, I'm showing you the heat map. These are the most predictive OTUs in the columns. And you can see that there are some OTUs that are present only in subject one, uh, some that are present only in subject two, and, um, and then maybe a few that are, uh, that are only absent in subject three. And this again is a very easy classification task. We get almost 100% accuracy, which means, um, it means that we can tell from the keyboard, uh, the, the microbial sequences from a keyboard, which person has been touching it. So um, what I want to talk about next is how we're actually estimating the accuracy of the model. So we haven't, we haven't opened up the model to see the nuts and bolts yet. Um, but you really don't need to know how the model works in order to, um, to apply it. But you do have to know how to estimate how well it's doing at classifying. And as a general rule, most machine learning models have to balance this trade-off between not being complex enough and being too complex. So what I'm showing you here is a plot of the prediction error. So um, lower is better. And this is how well the model classifies new uh, data points that it hasn't seen before. So um, on the far left end, you have models that have very low complexity. So they might only have a few parameters in them. And then on the far right end, you have very complex models that have lots of parameters. And what happens is if you go too far to the left, then you'll see, um, you'll see that the model doesn't have enough flexibility to learn the associations between your independent variables and your outcome. So it doesn't fit your data, your training data very well. And that's shown in blue. So that's the error on the training data. So basically, uh, the model never gets, never gets low error rates, even within the training data that you're uh, using to train the model. Then when you apply the model to holdout data, this is test data that it hasn't seen before, it also does poorly, of course. And that's shown in the uh, error rate for the, in the red line. Now, if you go to the other end, so the right end where the models are more complex, the, so this, this means that there are lots more free parameters. The model is more flexible. Um, this could be the equivalent of a um, linear regression where you have lots of coefficients, um, maybe, maybe one coefficient for every single independent variable. And then what happens is the more flexible you make the model, the, more, um, the, the lower the error rate on the training data. So the better and better it fits the training data. But at a certain point, it's fitting it too well. So it's learning idiosyncrasies in the training data that aren't going to generalize to new data. So um, if you look at the red line, that's the one we care about. That's how well the model performs on future data it hasn't seen yet. So as you make the model more and more complex, it gets um, the error on the holdout test data gets better and better and better. And then as it starts to get too complex, the holdout error gets worse because it's overfitting. So on the left end, we have underfitting. On the right end, we have overfitting. And the job of a machine learning classifier is to find some point in the middle where it's not, um, it's not overfitting or underfitting and has the lowest prediction accuracy, I mean, uh, lowest prediction error on holdout data. Now, how do we assess the accuracy of a model? So it's extremely important to have some holdout data that you're able to try the model out on. Um, and uh, the most common way to do this, well, 
A nice way to do it would be if you actually had a whole separate part of your data that you could just leave um, alone until you've finished training the model and then you could see how accurate it is. But often in biological data sets, we don't have that many data points. So instead, what we do is cross-validation. It's a very common approach. We, um, we cut the data up into bins. So here's an example with five bins. And uh, you would pick one of the bin bins to be the validation bin. Then you, and this is done randomly. Then you train the model using the other four bins and see how accurate it is on the held out data, the validation data. So that's one fold. Then you put that data back in, pick a different bin to be the um, holdout or validation data, train the model on the other n minus one bins and see how, so completely from scratch, uh, retrain the model, see how well it performs on the new held out validation data. And then you do that three more times and you've got, uh, you've got five different estimates of the accuracy of the model and you take the average of those. So this is a very common approach. There's, there's a, major, um, a major risk of overfitting though that, uh, that people often succumb to. So I wanna take a little bit of time to discuss how you can avoid information leak. And um, inf so information leak means that you're not um, adhering to this uh, requirement that you train the model on one set of data and test it on another set. Um, so <clears throat> the, the right way would be if, you, if you're going to be um, trying lots of different models, you'd like to actually have training data, validation data, which could just be cross-validation, and then you hold, try a whole bunch of different models and then test them on an even, uh, even another set of held out data. And, um, and it's very important when you're reporting the accuracy of your model that you never let the model know anything about that final holdout data that you're using. And um, if, if you do let your model use the test data in any way to choose some of its settings say uh, the values of parameters, the number of features to include, then the estimates of error are invalid because the model's cheating. It's gonna pick the parameters that minimize, how, minimize the error on the holdout data. Um, so here's an information leak example. Let's say you want to determine how many rare taxa to include in your model. And you try filtering your model at 0 0.001%, 0 0.01%, um, 0.1% and 1%. For each value, you run the supervised learning script in Chime with tenfold cross-validation, and then you choose the model with the lowest cross-validation error. So um, why is this not okay? Well, you're, you here were, were part of the training or tuning process because uh, you were manually trying lots of different values and you picked the value that made it perform best on holdout data. So you're not actually assessing how well the model performs on holdout data um, because it's biased toward that particular set of holdout data that you were using. Here's another example. Um, let's say you want to identify bacterial genes that are associated with Crohn's disease. So there are too many genes to test all of them with a t-test. Basically, um, you, you run the t-tests and then you get some significant, but you do false discovery rate correction and now none of them are significant. So instead, you, do, you run some machine learning on these data, like let's say you uh, use the machine learning in Chime. You get it to select the most predictive features or genes, and then you run t-tests only on that subset of highly predictive genes. And guess what? Your results are significant. But of course they are because those are the features that, um, that were most discriminative in that data set. Uh, and there are, the more features you have, you're always going to have some that are uh, associated with your outcome just by chance. And relying on the correction of the p-values for multiple testing um, is going to take care of that. But if you use some other trick to select them, 
and then run it through the, the t-tests, you're basically cheating. Um, so that's another example of information leak. Now, this is a little bit more advanced, um, but I'm going to show you the right way to do nested cross-validation. So this is when you, when you want to do machine learning on a very small data set, and you actually want to try lots of different models or lots of different um, parameters. And you, so you don't have enough data to keep separate uh, holdout test data. Instead, what you would do is what we call nested cross-validation. So let's say we're still using five bins. We're going to chop the data up arbitrarily into five bins, choose one of them to be the test data, and we're going to hold that out. Then the remaining 80% of the data, we cut that up into five bins and do cross-validation within those. Um, here I'm showing actually four bins within there, but you know whatever number you choose is fine. So now we, we, have, uh, we have multiple um, steps of training, test, training, test, training, test within the training section of this. And the whole purpose of that is to try lots of different models and find the best one. Then we lock that model in, train it again on the whole um, set here, the whole 80%, and test it on the test data. So, um, so that's one full nested cross-validation loop. Then we would pick a different bin to be our test data, do an internal cross-validation on the other bins um, to train the model or choose the best model, and then test it on the holdout model. And so that way, you've separated the training of your model or choosing which model to use from the, um, from the actual evaluation of the model. And you would be amazed at how many papers you see, even, uh, even papers using machine learning, um, that, that don't do this and that are probably overfitting their data and therefore overestimating the, uh, the accuracy of the model. Um, so in summary, the, uh, supervised learning is trying to learn a model that will predict outcomes for novel samples. Um, one example would be to classify cancer patients before they begin treatment to determine which treatment path to give them. Models generally have to balance low complexity and high complexity um, to avoid either underfitting or overfitting. So they want to kind of find a sweet spot where they have just enough flexibility to capture the relevant variation in uh, the training data. And then finally, the accuracy should be assessed always in a separate test data set that it has never seen. Tenfold cross-validation is the most common way of doing this. I showed you five-fold as an example because it was easier to uh, picture on a slide. But um, you, you want to be very careful that you're always showing the, um, the accuracy estimates where the model, when it was choosing its parameters, never saw the holdout data. When you're using the supervised learning um, methods in Chime, you don't have to worry about the nested cross-validation because they don't do any tuning. Uh, there's a model that's in there called Random Forest, which we'll see in the next video.